Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the third in the uh, Lenten series for 2021. Uh, my topic tonight is almsgiving, and uh, I've got an enormous amount of ground to cover in very little time, so it'll, it's going to feel like a gallop on a very fast horse. Uh, I'm going to be throwing out a lot of scripture references. Probably the best thing is just to listen and not try to write them all down. I think it'd be better that way because there's so many, but it's an important topic and it's a neglected topic for most Protestant churches. It's really a Catholic topic. So the idea of almsgiving, just so we can start with the definition, is it's a, it's a, it's a part of the larger topic of stewardship. And almsgiving in the Christian tradition is basically particularly giving to the needs of the needy and the poor. And it goes all the way back to the Old Testament. It comes over to the New Testament, and then it goes into the history of the early church in the book of Acts, and then throughout church history, and it comes down to us. So a couple of things by way of introduction, just so that we all stay together. The first thing is it's very important to distinguish between regular or basic stewardship and almsgiving. So we all know that the biblical call is of a tithe, and we don't have time to get way off on the theology of stewardship tonight, but can I just remind you that the idea of tithing in the Bible is not uh, everything belongs to me, and then I have to give 10% because God's mean. Uh, it's also not uh, God gets 90% and I get 10%. That's not it either. The idea of 10% is from the Old Testament, and it's, and it's the idea of first fruits. And in the old covenant, when you blessed your first son or your, or your first child, and when you bless your first fruits, what you were doing is consecrating the whole. So the idea is the first tenth represents it all. So the key idea of stewardship is everything belongs to God. And we're accountable for everything that we have before the Lord. And it's just taken as a given throughout church history that tithing is a basic standard. This is something that is above and beyond tithing. And it's something that's expected as part of our Christian duty, as part of the Christian community, but it's also part of our Christian duty as part of the common good and the common society that we inhabit as citizens. It's both of those things. And it basically means if you become aware of a need, if you see a need, if there's any way that you can open your heart to something that comes to your ears or your eyes, God calls you, if you can, to respond. And God has a particular concern for the poor. And your hands and eyes become his hands and eyes as you reach out to them. And all that almsgiving is in terms of Lenten discipline is just a particular call to us to be sensitive to the call to do this during Lent, which I'll get to later. All right, so let me just take a quick romp through the Bible on this. And what I want to do is just begin in the Old Covenant and basically give you the idea of the way that almsgiving worked in the Old Covenant. And the, and the whole idea of, of almsgiving in the Old Covenant is very beautiful, and it's basically this. Your household is an extension of the covenant community and of the kingdom. So if you have anybody living in your household who comes to visit, and remember back in the ancient Near East, it was a very agrarian society and people were constantly coming and going. And the only way that you could travel is if you could be a guest. So the biggest value in the ancient Near East was hospitality because if you didn't have hospitality, you couldn't travel and everybody traveled. So everybody was dependent on one another. And so it was a regular thing for you to have people coming through your household who were not immediate members of your family, either nuclear or extended. And what the old covenant says is, if you have such a person in your household, first of all, if it happens to be the Sabbath and you have them in your household, you have a particular obligation to that person to invite them to worship. You can't just pretend that they're not there or somehow pretend that you're not part of the covenant community and you can just treat them as separate. You need to try to include them in the covenant and, and realize that their presence is not, as far as God is concerned, a, an accident. So there's this huge doctrine of neighborliness and extension that goes with hospitality in the Old Testament. And then that's extended beyond simple hospitality to a particular hospitality to the poor. And if, if you want an example, and this is just one scripture verse, I, like I said, I don't think it's gonna be helpful if you take them all down because there's so many, but let me just read you Deuteronomy 
15 verses 7 to 11 to show you one example of how this actually works, right? It's a very agricultural society. It's a very agrarian society. So you've got these people who are part of your community and you know that they're not as well off as they should be as anybody who is a normal person would want to be. And so if you read in Deuteronomy chapter 15, beginning at verse 7, it reads this way. If there is a poor man, one of your brethren, in any of your towns within your land, which the Lord God your, gives you, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against your poor brother, but you shall open your hand to him and you shall lend him sufficient for his need. And listen to this next part, whatever it may be, take heed lest there be a base thought in your heart. And you say, well, the, the, the seventh year is near. That's a reference to the Jubilee year. And it's, it's, a, it's a clever part of the Old Covenant community. Once every seven years, you actually let the land lie fallow. And, and the idea there is if it's the fifth of the sixth year, somehow you could say, well, this guy's poor and he needs help, but, but I'm just going to wait until a year and a half from now when the land lies fallow and he can, he can solve it then, as if you don't have to be generous now. It's not letting you off the hook in any way. So basically what you have to do as a conscious member of the old covenant community is constantly be aware of the fact that you need to rope people in to the covenant and to worship, but you also need to open your heart and your hand and your ears to anybody in need. And one of the simplest ways to illustrate that is farming, which of course is a huge part of it. And basically what the idea was is if you had a field, you did up to the edges, but not, not beyond the edge of the edge and never over the edge because you always left harvest on the edges of your field, always, even if there was nobody there. Why? Because people who didn't have enough would frequent the fields and they would come along. It's almost like the, uh, the end of a bread loaf, right? Right. A lot, a lot of people don't like to eat the last piece, right? And it's, it's, it's kind of that as idea with farming and you leave that there. And if, you, if we had time, I could take you to the book of Ruth in chapter two, when, when Boaz actually goes above and beyond this, because you may remember he has got a kind of a special affection in his heart for this woman this, who, who's kind of come into his life that, that has surprised him, whose name is Ruth. And so, so in her case, instead of uh, just leaving the edges for her, he actually leaves the sheaves, which are the left, leftovers from his own harvest. And then he goes even beyond that. And he, he actually says to his workers, you know, why don't you guys just why don't you kind of drop a few? And so, so she has the stuff they dropped, the sheaves that they left, and the edges. And that's, an exa that's a super abundant example of mercy because Boaz is going above and beyond because he wants to make, make, make absolutely sure that she is somebody who is treated hospitably. And that idea of opening your heart and leaving something on the edges and being aware of the fact that if you were that person and you didn't have any food at all, you could go out at any time of day, particularly at night when no one was there because you'd be embarrassed. You could go to the edges of the field and you could, go, you could gather something up. And it was your responsibility as a member of the Old Covenant community to do that. And that idea works all the way through the Old Testament and comes over to the New. It works over into the Sabbath year, which is that seventh year. And, it, and then there's a Jubilee year, which is the seven times seventh year, which is the 50th year, which we don't have time to get into. And that's, those are just more examples of giving away to the poor in a, in a very wonderful way. But it comes in the Psalms, you see little teeny references, but one of the best places you see it is in Proverbs. And I just brought three tonight, which I'd like to read to you. So here's Proverbs 14, verse 21. Those who despise their neighbors are sinners, right? That's pretty basic. But listen to the next half of the verse. But happy are those who are kind to the poor. That's Proverbs 14, verse 21. So, so the, the description of a blessed person living properly in God's creation, which is what the book of Proverbs is about, is it's somebody who goes out of their way to be conscious of and kind to the poor. Here's uh, verse 31 of the same chapter. Those who oppress the poor insult their maker, but those who are kind to the needy honor him. And then just one more, chapter 21, verse 13. If you close your ear to the cry of the poor, you will cry out and not be heard. 
Proverbs 21, verse 13. And you get, you get the idea. So all through the Old Testament, there's this sense of being aware of, being conscious of, going out of your way to make sure that people who don't have provision, people who cry out, people who are particularly in need, are able to be provided for in any way that you can. You, you need to try to make that happen. And that's not the first fruits. That's your obligation as a basic member of the Old Covenant community and as a basic citizen of Israelite society. Everybody with me so far? All right, now, of course, you come over to the New Testament and it gets completely radicalized, surprise, surprise, and you get our Lord. And it's an interesting topic, Jesus and poverty, usually not preached on, usually not taught about. Can I just remind you as we begin that so far as we can tell, he begins his life by being born in a caravansary, which is basically a, it's a kind of a leftover place outside of an inn, which is a barn for animals and for people who are kind of uh, the leftovers of society who need a place to stay and they get stuck with the animals. So he, he begins basically by being born in a place which is for animals and for those who are poor. And of course, at the end of his life, he's crucified between, you know the story, two thieves, right? two bandits who have absolutely nothing, literally nothing. So he begins his life in poverty and he ends his life in poverty. And all through his teaching, there's a consistent theme of the importance of the poor. And you have something like Luke chapter four, verses 16 to 19, which is the, the synagogue at Nazareth. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's quoting Isaiah 61 because he has anointed me to bring good news. And what does it say? Everybody leaves this part out good news to the poor. That's the first thing Jesus says when he opens the synagogue scroll in Isaiah. The first thing that he says about himself when he quotes the scriptures that day, I come to preach good news to the poor. And you all know the, the parable of the sheep and the goats with its particular attention to, to the impoverished. But you got lots of other things too, like uh, the, the parable of the the, the, the wedding feast where you get the people who are invited and you get the people who, who, who don't want to be invited and aren't very interested. And Jesus says, but when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame and the blind, he says, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you and you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Right? So don't give a party and just invite the people that you like or the people that might scratch your back if, if you scratch theirs, right? Quid pro quo. But actually go out of your way if you're going to have a party to try to think about people who never get invited to any parties and who, who, who others, others don't even know their name. All right? So that's Jesus. And of course, that's a special part of his own ministry. He's always noticing the person who's farthest out, right? Think of Luke 7 verses 36 to 50 in the the woman at Simon the Pharisee's house, right? She's, she's a disaster. Simon's the one that invited him over for dinner. Everybody's got their prim and proper clothes on because the rabbi's over for dinner and she's, she's terrible. And who does Jesus pay attention to? Her, in fact, she's the heroine of the story. And he makes Simon follow her as his example. That's typical Jesus. So there's a particular association of Jesus with the poor. There's a deep concern of Jesus all through his ministry for the poor. And there's a constant teaching of Jesus of the importance of the poor. And then when you get to the early church, it's a huge part of the early church. And one of the really pretty verses is Galatians 2, verse 10, which I wanted to make sure to read to you. It's a, it's a description of a lot of the early church's collections for the poor and the needy, which they did on a regular basis. It wasn't just that churches were generous with their regular giving, but they went out of their way to find out about other churches that were in destitute situations because there were lots of things like wars and famines. And they took up collections from the churches that were better off, particularly for the churches that were going through a really tough time and didn't have any way to meet their own needs because they didn't even have, in some cases, abilities to work and, and have income, kind of like a number of people in our situation today with the pandemic. And here's what Paul says in Galatians 2 verse 10. They asked only one thing, listen, that we remember the poor, which was actually what I was eager to do. It's a fascinating verse. You could ask yourself the question, would anybody ever describe you or our church or our diocese as a community that's eager to help the poor? That's, what, that's how you, that would be an accurate description of the early church. 
it would be an accurate description of Jesus, and it would certainly be an accurate description of the ancient Near Eastern community uh, when they were following Yahweh the way that Yahweh wanted them to. All right. And it comes all the way through the church tradition down to us. And uh, it, it just means that when you have a relationship, when you have eyes, when you have ears, when you see people, you have to find a way to respond if you can. And you've got to ask the Lord uh, to make you sensitive to those needs in ways that make a difference. And when you ta tackle this subject, brothers and sisters, the, the hardest thing that you run into is where we find ourselves in the West in the 21st century. And for this, we need a book by a guy named David Shipley, which is called The Invisible Poor. And I'll reference for you a, a really interesting course at Harvard. And by the way, you can take this course for free online if you ever want a, a life-changing experience. Uh, Michael Sandel, who teaches ethics at Harvard, teaches a, a MOOC course called Justice. And Michael Sandel has a lot of fascinating observations about American society and that culture. But one of the things Michael Sandel says is, um, basically until the 50s and 60s in America, anywhere that you went that was a public setting, like let's just take a baseball game, which is one of the examples that he uses, or a public school, anywhere that you went, all of the classes of American society would be there. So if you went to like a Boston Red Sox game in Boston in the 50s, you would have everybody from somebody who could barely make ends meet to, to, to somebody who owned several businesses and everything in between, they would all be there, right, at the, at the stadium. And, so, and they'd rub shoulders with one another so that you could be conscious of the fact that you, you knew that people who had needs were around because you'd rub shoulders with them. And what Sandel points out is really until the 50s and 60s, in, for most of American history, this wasn't an issue because your ears – and eyes didn't have to be challenged to find people who had needs. You were constantly exposed at a baseball game, at the supermarket, in your public school setting. But when you get to the late 20th century, especially in the 21st century, what happens is the poor become invisible. And if you think about this, you, you know that it's true and he's onto something. And there's so many examples I could give. So when I first wrestled with this whole topic, one of the things I found myself asking was, okay, um, how do I become conscious of people who are there and I'm not sure that I'm seeing them? So here's, a, here's one of the earliest examples I came across. Okay, so you're in a hotel, right? So there's a whole cleaning crew in the hotel. So ask yourself this question. How many guests interact with the cleaning crew? If you want an interesting mental exercise, because I've been doing this for years, almost nobody in a hotel even makes eye contact with the help never mind talks to them. And what almsgiving means is what you learn to do is you learn, first of all, you, 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 you acknowledge them. Second of all, you speak to them. But third of all, you tip them, right? Which is very easy to do. You just leave a little note, you say thank you, and you leave you know, a certain amount of money. It's, it's up to you in the what used to be an ashtray, except now we got non-smoking rooms only. So, but you got the idea. The, the point is, you, it's, it's hard to calculate the difference that you can make in somebody's life if you tip somebody who's a housekeeper for taking care of your room. But the reality is, you have to work really hard to do that now, whereas in the 50s and 60s, it was something that was much, much easier to do. And so the challenge of this topic of almsgiving is for each one of us to ask the question, where are these people in our lives and how can we see them and what can we do for them? So I, I wrote down a list, um, garbage delivery, paper delivery, yard work, restaurant workers. I found myself asking myself this question this week. Wouldn't it be great? I used to, I spent a summer washing dishes. I don't know if any of you have ever done that in a restaurant. I, I did it at a, at a summer home of the YMCA for a whole summer. It's a horrible job. <laughs> you don't see any people. The only people I saw were waitresses on occasion when they brought their glass trays back. But imagine going to a restaurant and, uh, and asking at the end of your meal, um, the owner or you know, the proprietor or the maitre d' at the front, if you can just go speak to the dishwasher, okay? Well, first of all, they haven't seen anybody at the restaurant because they're back there and nobody even knows that they exist. But second of all, you can go speak to them and you, can, you, and you could actually give them a tip and thank them. That's, that's an example of almsgiving 
in the kind of old covenant sense. And the question you got to ask yourself is, what are ways that you can see this and hear this? And what are ways that you can respond? And uh, I know that you have people that take out your garbage and you can, you can fill an envelope with a thank you card and you can walk out when they come to get your garbage and you can give them a thank you card. And I promise you, I've done this and you would not believe the difference it makes. Um, most people don't even treat them like they're there and you give them a thank you card. That's, that's the idea of almsgiving. So the question that this discipline asks us to ask ourselves is, what would it look like at Christ St. Paul's if not just us as individuals, but us as a whole community, if we started to try to do this? And it, it, it's, it's, it's an awesome discipline and it's a tremendous uh, part of our heritage. And it's something I think that we need to recover. So if Jesus thought it was important and if the Old Testament thought it was important and the early church did it, it's something for us to consider as well. Thank you. Out of time. <laughs>